Hello everyone, Ollie here and welcome back to the channel. This is going to be one of those videos trying to help you through your medical interviews successfully and this is actually going to be the first NHS hot topic uh, video. So there are a few topics that are particularly relevant to the way healthcare is done in the UK, at least at the moment, and this one, antibiotic resistance, might be a talking point for you at your interview. So we see it in the news quite a lot, it's a really really obvious topic and I feel like if a medical school were to ask you a question about topics relevant to the NHS it would be one of the big ones that would be more likely to come up than others. And actually this is something I understand a little bit about being from a kind of bacteriology, molecular biology type background and there is a huge amount that we could say about this but I'm going to try and distill this down and approach it in a logical and structured manner and try and make it a little bit accessible because I know everyone won't be from a science background so we don't need to look at it massively scientifically but we do need to understand the core principles. So I think the best way to start something like this is just define our terms. So antibiotic resistance, what do we actually mean? Well an antibiotic is simply a particular type of antimicrobial drug that is used to either kill bacteria or prevent them from growing. And one thing we should note right away is that they are not effective against viral infections. You need another type of drug called an antiviral to do that. Antibiotics are used to kill bacteria. And because we take them for granted so much these days, they feel like a thing that's been around forever, but antibiotics have not actually been used in medicine for that long. They were popularized in the middle of the 20th century, particularly following uh, the Second World War, during which bacterial infections killed an enormous number of people, the first two world wars. So by the late 1940s, kind of 1950s, that time, people had a pretty good understanding of how they could be used. They were actually discovered right at the end of the 19th century, I believe, or kind of antimicrobial action was discovered to be a thing right at the end of the 1890s. But anyway, we have them now, and at least in the developed world, they have meant that a lot of diseases and bacterial infections that would have previously either been fatal or caused a lot of pain and suffering are now either pretty trivial infections that can just be treated with something like penicillin, or they're simply extremely scarce and actually approaching eradication in some cases, such as with tuberculosis. And again, we don't need to go into it too far, but there are a few different ways by which antibiotics might work. So one of the most common ways is that they interfere with the formation of the bacterial cell wall or the cell membrane, which obviously stops them surviving because everything just leaks everywhere. Or alternatively, they might do things like interfere with essential uh, enzymes or biosynthetic pathways so the bacteria either can't respire properly or make the things that they actually need to survive. So either way, it'll stop the bacteria growing or just kill them. And as you probably know, antibiotics work really well. They are very good at doing what they do. And because they're so good, obviously, logically, that's the first thing you would do if someone comes in with a bacterial infection. You give them an antibiotic because it will solve the problem. But it's this action, this kind of ubiquity of deployment that has led to the evolution of antibiotic resistance. And again, I'm going to try and keep this as simple as I can, but if you have a bacterium that experiences a genetic mutation, so a, a change to its DNA, that allows this bacterium to resist the effects of an antibiotic drug in some way, it becomes what we call resistant. The antibiotic drug will no longer kill it or at least if it doesn't kill it, it doesn't stop it reproducing and growing. And just to try and illustrate this with a practical example, let's say that I take a swab um, from the inside of your intestine, right? So there'll be many bacteria in there, just kind of hanging out and doing what they do, helping with digestion, and we then grow them all up in a culture. So we've got lots of different bacteria around. What we'll then do is an apply an antibiotic. So it will kill virtually everything, apart from things that are resistant to it. So the surviving bacteria will have a gene of some sort or a mutation that allows them to resist the effects of that drug. But now everything else has been killed, there's no competition for them, so they just reproduce like crazy and colonize the entire environment again, completely unaffected by the antibiotic. And so at this point you have a resistant colony of bacteria 
to which your original antibiotic that you used will do absolutely nothing because they all have the same genes, they're descended from that first resistant one. And what that now means as a consequence is that if you want to get rid of this new colony, you have to use a different antibiotic from the first one in order to kill them. And then obviously at this point the exact same process can happen again, as long as there's a tiny bit of variation in your new colony, the ones that are resistant to the second one will outcompete everything else and then you have the same problem again, apart from this new colony is then resistant to both of your antibiotics. And this is all down to genetics, the resistant bacteria are able to reproduce, they pass on their resistance genes to their offspring, and actually it becomes even more complicated and difficult to deal with because bacteria, as well as reproducing clonally, so they pass on their genes in what's called vertical transmission, between generations if you like, they can also pass their genes between individuals through exchanging things called plasmids, which carry DNA around basically, they're like loops that carry genes, so they can exchange them between themselves regardless of whether they're related or not. And not only that, but a single gene could confer resistance to multiple antibiotic drugs, so this can very quickly get out of control. But obviously you don't want to be a bacteriologist, you want to be a doctor, so why is this clinically relevant to the NHS? Well, one of the ways in which this problem can actually be dealt with is by encouraging patients to finish their courses of antibiotics, because if they don't do that, it exacerbates this problem. And the typical case of this is a patient will, you know, say they, they get a bacterial infection, so they get some symptoms that go along with that. There'll be some swelling, some pain, maybe some discharge or whatever. They go to the doctor to do something about it. The doctor prescribes them some antibiotics, the patient will then take the antibiotics until the symptoms go away. And the symptoms may have gone away, but that doesn't mean that all of the bacteria are gone, it might just mean that there's not enough of them around to cause the symptoms that you see on a larger scale, but they might still be there, but the patient stops taking the antibiotics so not all of the bacteria are killed. But because you've used an antimicrobial drug, there has been a selection pressure applied, the ones that are left are probably the ones that are good at resisting the effects of the drug, otherwise they wouldn't still be there. So this is just pretty simple natural selection, evolution, you've created almost a new resistant strain in yourself. This is why in terms of antibiotic prescribing, it's really important to do it sparingly, and that when patients do it, they have to finish the course of antibiotics, otherwise this problem just happens all the time. So how does this problem actually manifest? I mean, the big one that you've probably heard of is MRSA, that's methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Methicillin is a, a common antibiotic drug that's used in hospitals. And this is a highly contagious um, agent, it's spread through skin contact, you can pick it up off surfaces pretty easily, and because it, it has multiple resistances to a, a particular class of antibiotics, like a particular mechanism, you have to use specialist antibiotics to treat it. And the reason it's so well known is that in hospitals, it's not uncommon for people to go in without MRSA infection, and then go in for some sort of invasive procedure like surgery where there's an open wound, then they get an infection. And in hospitals, obviously, there's very large numbers of people in a small space, there's high bed turnover rates, lots of human contact between people, and a lot of use of antibiotics in that environment as well, so it's like a breeding ground for this problem. So MRSA is the big one, and there was a scare, I think it was a couple of years ago, although I can't quite remember, with some form of E. coli in the States that was resistant to colistin which is one of the kind of last resort antibiotics that's only used in cases where the bacterium in question is resistant to everything else. So what can anyone do about it? Well, the big thing, as weird as it sounds, so that begs the question, what can anyone actually do about this problem? The big one is hand washing. It's something we were taught early on in medical school to do properly, and wherever you go in hospitals, there'll be a ton of hand washing stations with guidelines on how to do it properly. The second thing to talk about is getting patients to finish their courses of prescribed antibiotics, that's really, really important. There are a few other strategies you might want to talk about, um, one of them is rotating the use of antibiotics in hospitals, so hospitals adjacent to one another might use 
different common prescriptions or not using the same one all the time basically so not all the bacterial populations are exposed to the same drug. There's a big concern with putting antibiotics in livestock feed obviously that helps um, cattle to grow big and strong to use for meat or dairy but it also means that you're developing these resistant strains in the livestock. And another one is using narrow spectrum antibiotics, so using ones that are quite specific in their action, because then it's less likely that large amounts of the bacteria will develop resistance to it if it acts in a very particular way. And I guess the last big one is simply maintaining as many last resort options that you don't use anywhere else as possible. And all of this kind of begs the question, why aren't we developing more antibiotics? It's a very good question with a pretty simple answer that unfortunately it's not that easy to tackle, which is that it's not profitable for people to invest in antibiotic research. If you think about the ubiquity of antibiotics and the low cost at which they would need to be used to be effective, it simply isn't cost effective for a pharmaceutical company to invest the enormous amount of time and money that it takes to develop a new antibiotic, simply because the profit margins on them are so low. And when you combine that with the factors that we've mentioned before, like the fact that we don't really want to be using antibiotics in the first place, as well as the fact that they're used for short-term acute problems, rather than chronic conditions, chronic drugs are where pharmaceutical companies actually make their money. It just basically adds up to a lack of return on investment for pharmaceutical companies and drug developers. So basically we have to work sensibly with what we've got and make the most of any new novel mechanisms that are found. But that's where I'm going to finish this video guys, that actually went on longer than I was hoping for it to do, but it's a really interesting area of discussion and once I get on to kind of bacteriology I tend to ramble. The companion article to this video, as with all my videos, will simply be online at my website postgradmedic.com. I hope you found that useful. I tried to approach it in as structured a way as I could and a simpler way to get into it, but I appreciate that that won't have catered to everyone's learning styles and preferences. I'm still learning this kind of teaching game and I want to get better, so if you found it useful, tell me. If you've got any questions on this topic at all, like I say, it is something that I know a little bit about the background, so I'd be happy to answer any questions you have, or certainly find out the answer for you if I don't know. And as with all of these interview support videos, just if you've got any question that you would like me to provide a kind of structured approach to, just let me know by leaving a comment on this video, or getting in touch through the contact form on my website, again postgradmedic.com, um, particularly with regard to NHS hot topics. That's the this kind of mini-series. There'll be a few more uh, in the pipeline, but as always, if there's anything specific you'd like me to make a video on, my topics are largely audience-driven, so that's the best way to direct what I do and get your answer as quickly as possible. So thanks for watching, everyone. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more videos just like this. And one final time, go and check out postgradmedic.com. That's got a bunch of free resources that'll help you through every stage of the medical application process. Take care, and I'll see you in another video. Bye-bye.